change in the church. I'm sure that there is a lot more to say about change in the church than uh, we can handle in the coming hour, but let's have a try. The world around us changes. Technology, politics, life expectancy, for most people at least in the world, it has changed dramatically when it comes to the areas of travel and communication. It is changing when it comes to ideologies. The idea of globalization and having a multicultural world. And certainly also lately, we are talking a lot about change in, uh, in climate. So the world is changing in all kinds of ways. And People are changing. We, uh, we are living more and more in a secularized world. And we heard a little bit about that already in the, uh, in the minutes before we started, how some countries have really secularized. And uh, it was mentioned that we saw that in the Netherlands this past week in the uh, uh, results of the national elections the uh, what used to be major Christian parties have been decimated and uh, parties with other ideologies have taken their place. People have changed in at least the Western world, but to some extent increasingly also in the non-Western world from modern to postmodern. And some of the things that affect us the disappearance of absolute truth. Now we all have our own truth. And if you're happy with your truth, that is fine as long as you let me have my truth. There is still a lot of religiosity, but people do not like, many people do not like organized religion. And they like to put their own kind of religion together, kind of a smirkos board religion. It is uh, not only true for people outside of the church that they change, but it's also true for people inside the church, the Christian church. I was just reading an interview with the uh, Bishop of Uppsala in Sweden uh, in uh, one of our dailies in the Netherlands. And she was going on about how the church in her country has changed. And we could add that the church inside, the people inside our own church, there is many who have changed uh, in the last decades or so. There are concerns when we look at the church, I call it our church, the Adventist church in the Western world. We have been uh, growing exponentially for sometime. But we now see a stagnation of growth. When you look at the figures, we have been hovering around 22 million now for a number of years. We still baptize about a million people a year, but we are losing about as many. There is a problem with pastors. Um, it's been uh, indicated uh, during the annual council that there is a serious problem in the United States with many pastors going uh, for retirement in the, in the next decade. But that is true in quite a few other countries as well. And we are not getting enough theology students. And uh, as long as we are not ordaining women, we are going to face a serious shortage of pastors in uh, many countries in the Adventist church. Uh, there seem to be financial worries, but we always hear about that. And the interesting fact is that in fact, tithing is up in many places in the world, uh, in spite of uh, many people leaving the church. We're losing our young people 
that is perhaps the most uh, worrying thing, at least one of the most worrying things, that many of the young people no longer feel that the Adventist Church offers a real spiritual home for them. We see some institutions growing, but we see also some closing. Uh, we might say that there is some kind of an identity crisis. Who are we? What does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist? And there is actually quite a bit of discouragement. And I, I think that is true for many who are uh, listening to me at this moment, that uh, some of us, many of us, feel rather discouraged by some of the things changing, uh, happening in our church. And uh, for instance, when we have listened to the sermon of our uh, general conference president during the annual council, then discouragement is a weak word to describe what many of us feel. So there are problems in our church in the Western world. But when we're going to talk about change, then first of all, uh, we should not say that change, ch ch uh, change is impossible. In the past, the church has changed. And the pioneers would not recognize today's church. George Knight uh, used to say that if James White were alive today, he would not want to be a member of our church looking at the 28 fundamental beliefs. Pioneers would not recognize many, many aspects of today's church. There have been in the past, and there are still happening, changes in theology. Uh, certainly, uh, the church does not quite believe what it believed 150 years ago. There have been changes in organization, when we think, for instance, of the upheaval around 1901, when uh, the church really changed its organizational uh, model. There have been changes in, in worship, and there have been changes in uh, methods of outreach, in how we do evangelism, how we do our witnessing. And so if we realize that a church has been willing and able to change in the past, there should not be a reason to be afraid of further change. But when we are going to change, what are we going to change to? Do we want to return to the past? That is what quite a few people want, not only in our denomination. Many denominations also in the United States and certainly in the 19th century, have wanted to go back to early Christianity, to primitive Christianity. That was the time when everything was pure, when everything was right, and so the church must go back to that uh, situation of the beginning. Is that a valuable uh, option? Or should we go back to the time of the reformers? Uh, we sometimes call ourselves a continuation of the Reformation of the uh, 16th century. Is that the uh, time that we the uh, and the situation that we should go back to? Or should we go back to the time of the Advent pioneers, the Adventist pioneers? There are many in our church who believe that that is what we should do. What they believed is the standard. Uh, their theology is the standard. Their way of doing things is the standard. And uh, we should go back to that. Well, people who believe that have never made any solid study of what early Adventism was like. Uh, very few people would want to go back to all aspects of the Adventism of the pioneers. Historic Adventism is not the answer. And I believe there is a balance that we need. Of course, we must learn from the past. And it's good. And I wish that more of our people would know more of our past. 
And then they would also have a feeling that many of these things of the past were not as good as they are made out to be. And that uh, th there has been progress and that we should continue that progress. And uh, on the one hand, learning from the past, but on the other hand, being open towards the future, being willing to contemplate change. I believe that is the kind of balance that uh, we should be looking for. Now, is it all right to change? Uh, if we are looking for a biblical basis for our, for our considerations, for our talk, then uh, some people would want to emphasize the fact that it's dangerous to talk about change because you know, God does not change. And we're talking about, in Revelation 14, about the eternal gospel. So the gospel remains the same, and we should not uh, try to change anything. The Bible is there. The Bible does not change, they say. And, of course, many of our believers say there is absolute truth. We have found the truth. We have embraced the truth. And uh, uh, we should not uh, uh, change anything. And uh, there are absolute moral norms that we should adhere to. Now, to some extent, that is true. The Bible does not change. That's true. We have the eternal gospel. But our interpretation of what is truth uh, is never perfect. And so there has been changes in our interpretations and uh, further interpretations are always necessary in order to ensure that what we Adventists say is that our truth remains present truth. The Bible certainly is our basis, revelation, that is a key element of our religion, but we must realize that revelation has always been partial. Not everything has been really re revealed to us, either in the past or in the present. Revelation has always been progressive, and there is no reason to think that that progression has totally ended. Look at the plan of redemption as time has gone by and as the Bible has been written and uh, we have been able to think about the implications of the plan of redemption, revelation of what it means has increased. When we take the first uh, testimony, the old, the uh, first testament, the Old Testament, there is very little about the second coming. When we take the second uh, testament, the New Testament, then much more is revealed about the return of Jesus Christ. And the same is true for other doctrines like death and resurrection. If we only had the Old Testament, we would not have as full a picture as we have because of what the Apostle Paul and others have been saying about it. There are, in other words, many reasons to believe that truth is and continues to be progressive. Revelation is progressive. And the Bible offers different perspectives on the truth. Even within the Bible itself, we find different approaches, different dimensions. Uh, there's a good reason why we have four Gospels, four writers who uh, enlighten us about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, each from their own perspective. Uh, and there are differences. And the effort to make everything fit into one story is simple, not credible. There are different perspectives on truth when we listen to Peter, when we listen to John or Paul. And not all are exactly saying the same. But together, we get a full, fuller picture of what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. We see in the Bible 
uh, that changes have been implemented. Uh, things are not the, the, the same all through the centuries. When we look at the early beginnings of Old Testament times, there were several sanctuaries uh, in Israel before we had the temple in Jerusalem. And then, of course, there is, once we approach New Testament times, the synagogue. The origin of the synagogue is uh, rather uh, somewhat uh, uh, mysterious, but we see that uh, in the time of Jesus and the time of the apostle, the synagogue is there and is an important center, an important place for worship. It wasn't there earlier, but it's there and it has stayed. There have been changes in the way God's people have been worshiping. We see also in Bible times uh, changes in the way God's people are organized. Uh, we find how Moses, after his uh, father-in-law had given him some advice, uh, makes a change in the way things are organized, and he begins begins delegating, having people uh, dealing with groups. Uh, and I see that as a strange word here. Moses begins decalating, and uh, I will have to correct that and make that delegating. Sorry about that. In the New Testament, we find that uh, there is a need to bring about a certain amount of uh, further organization, and we find that deacons uh, are appointed, elders are appointed. It's something new. It is change. And certainly there is change when we look at Acts 15 and when uh, the uh, council there in Jerusalem decides to deal with Christians from the Gentiles in a particular way. That is the paradigm shift of change with Jews and Gentiles. Well, in short, there is a lot of reason why change is biblically justified. Uh, not change for the sake of change. And everything based on essential change, the most essential change that we must all undergo in our religious experience. 2 Peter 3, verse 17, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And growing means change, means perhaps leaving things behind, uh, accepting other things and uh, having a fuller experience than before. Now, what should change? Uh, do we need change in doctrines, uh, in worship? Is it maybe in spirituality, the, uh, the, 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 uh, what would I call it, the, 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 the uh, spirituality and rationality, a good balance between the two? Uh, should we change some of our standards, some of our moral principles? For instance, when it comes to gender equality, but of course, I should also mention the LGBTQ uh, situation. Do we need changes in, uh, in these regards? Do we perhaps have to relate in a different way to culture as we have often done in the past? Should we change when it comes to our communication, our witnessing methods, our use of technology in our witnessing perhaps? And is the kind of organization that our church has at the moment perhaps too complicated, too hierarchical, is there a reason maybe to change our organization? So where do we want change? In all of these categories, or would we be reluctant, certainly with regard to the first one, our doctrines? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, we have come from a situation where we had no creed, no uh, list of fundamental beliefs, 
and then we gradually created such a list of fan fundamental beliefs, which actually functions as a creed. And could it be possible that we should go to a new situation without such a list, no creed, or maybe a shorter list, or maybe a list that allows more, uh, gives more possibility to each of us to interpret things in certain ways. The pioneer said that we have no creed, but the Bible. Uh, there was a reluctance for a long time to formulate a statement of beliefs. And uh, we know the uh, uh, famous quote from John Loughborough, one of our, well, maybe second generation pioneers, uh, some would call him a pioneer, others uh, would say he is uh, a little later. Well, he died in 1924, so that's 100 years ago. He wrote in 1863, the first step of apostasy is to get up a creed, telling us what we should believe. The second is to make that creed a test of fellowship. The third is to try members by that creed. The fourth is to denounce as heretics those who do not believe that creed. And the fifth is to commence persecution against such. And I'm afraid that John Loughborough has a point and that in some way we are in the fourth and fifth stage where we denounce as heretics those who do not actually believe in our creed of 28 fundamental beliefs and that there are signs that there is uh, some, uh, call it persecution, but at least there are taken some measures against those that uh, do not fully accept the 28 fundamental beliefs. So maybe John Loughborough had a point, an important point. Should we have doctrinal change? Well, we must say that doctrines have changed in the past, and I'm going to say something more about it in a minute. And the preamble introduction to our fundamental beliefs uh, have that possibility. They, they, they say it should be possible to find new words, new arguments, uh, for our fundamental beliefs in the future. I'll come back to that as well. If we really believe that the Holy Spirit is guiding us in our search for truth, then it's important that we continue to give the Holy Spirit time and, ch and space to lead us on. While on the one hand, we need to protect our theological identity, not everything goes. We should encourage dialogue, study, uh, and continue to grow in our understanding of what we believe. And create a climate in which spiritual growth and discovery are not discouraged, but are nurtured. And that is something that needs to happen at all levels at the church. But if it is not happening at the higher levels, let us at least try to implement that at the lower level, in the local church also, in a conference. Create a climate in which spiritual growth and discovery are nurtured. Uh, maybe the doctrinal change is one of a development of new arguments or new uh, terminology or make sure that that our uh, doctrines are presented in such a way that uh, they are present truth that is that they are relevant for the situation in which we live in 2023 and that we are prepared to give up some ideas. 
Now, some of this is happening as we speak in a limited way, but these are things that we should be prepared, I believe, to foster. Early Adventists were living, were living with quite a bit of diversity in doctrine. They were not all agreed. They started with uh, the uh, difference of opinion about what was called the shut door and what was called the open door theology. Uh, uh, after uh, the 1844 disappointment. There was a lot of discussion about when to begin the Sabbath. Some for a long time said it should be six o'clock. Others said it should be sundown. Others were uh, having other opinions. Doctrines were in flux. For decades, there was only a gradual consensus. In our prophetic interpretations, there were differences, diversity. Often Smith, Uriah Smith, was not in agreement with, for instance, James White. And uh, sometimes uh, the uh, uh, difference in opinion led to very heated discussions. There was disagreement with regard to the amount of organization that our church needed. Some said organizing means that we are automatically part of Babylon, where others said that we needed organization in order to be efficient in our mission. Uh, gradually, there was a growing consensus on the major points of our doctrines, but there was no complete uniformity of opinion for a very long time, if there ever was. Ellen White wrote in 1890, the brethren should not feel that it is a virtue to stand apart because they do not see all minor points in the same light. If on fundamental truth they are at agreement, they should not differ and dispute about matters of little real importance. Well, the brethren did not always listen to Ellen White, and they certainly did not listen to this piece of advice. If you, for instance, see how in 1888, uh, one of the main uh, discussions at that general conference was the identity of the ten toes of the image of Daniel II. And uh, that was not just that there were different opinions, but they were really indifferent uh, parties and, and scolding one another because they differed on who the uh, ten toes represented. Ellen White says that should not be uh, uh, tr should not trouble us, us if we uh, have different opinions about secondary issues. Soon there was in Adventism uh, a major degree of agreement, however, uh, with regarding to the main points of our beliefs. We had a high view of the Bible, maybe different opinions about what what uh, uh, the inspiration of the Bible exactly meant, the mechanics of inspiration, but the Bible was important to us. Salvation through Jesus Christ even though there were often legalistic undertones. There was a consensus about the continued validity of God's law, the Sabbath, and about the perennial, literal return of Christ. There were always problems with regard to the sanctuary, but the sanctuary was an essential part of Adventist teachings and the role of Jesus Christ as our high priest. From the beginning, we practiced believers' baptism. Most of our early members came from denominations where baptism by immersion was being uh, practiced. Quite soon, we reached consensus about what happens when we die, conditional immortality, and in the historicist interpretation of apocalyptic, apocalyptic prophecy. So there were many points 
of agreement, but some things took a lot longer. Uh, it took decades before we had sorted out the issue of clean and unclean meat. Uh, and in spite of what many people think, we never actually became vegetarians. Even today, a minority in the church has accepted vegetarianism. Righteousness by faith, in order to sort that out, we remember the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference where things really hotted up, but even then things were not sorted out completely. That took a long time. And we may ask ourselves whether it has ever been sorted out in some segments of the church. There was a lot of discussion about uh, financial matters. We had uh, a particular system of supporting the church uh, before we uh, uh, introduced tithing as we know it today. The, before it was what was called systematic benevolence, which was more based on possession than income as tithing is. And we know that it took a long time and even it is not fully clear even today uh, for many people, the doctrine of the Trinity, of the full divinity of Christ, and the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we made strong progress with regard to these doctrines, but there have unfortunately always been uh, groups in the church that have had difficulty accepting these things. Can we have some further development in the future? I already referred to the preamble of our statement of fundamental beliefs. And it's important, I think, that we, we read this statement. Uh, this gives us the freedom, it gives us the possibility to uh, develop our statement of fundamental beliefs at least somewhat further. Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed. It's interesting that the word creed is mentioned here and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. These beliefs that set forth uh, here constitute the church's understanding and expression of the teachings of Scripture. Now, revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of the Bible truth or finds better language in which to express the teachings of God's holy word. So it's clear that these statements can be revised. Now, whether the process to go through a general conference uh, session and the assumption that the session is led by the Holy Spirit, whether that is really uh, something that we fully subscribe to, but a fuller understanding of Bible truth or better language is something that we officially at least subscribe to. Again, is doctrinal change possible? We have seen it in other denominations, Catholics, Protestants, who have been able to uh, revise their doctrinal positions often by simply no longer emphasizing them or leaving them out altogether. Uh, uh, we must, that is clear to me, when it comes to doctrinal change, we must allow for a development in the interpretation of the Bible, of our doctrines. And uh, uh, one of the things that is especially important also in this connection is redefine the role of Ellen White. Uh, what role does she have, uh, should she have, in uh, defining our doctrinal positions? And I would hope that the Church will be able to go back to some of its official statements and in uh, the role of the Church's hierarchy, the leaders uh, in uh, defining 
uh, or revising our doctrinal positions. Is there a risk when you start looking at your doctrines and uh, your position papers of the past? Certainly. And some people will say that uh, that, uh, that 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 gives the risks that uh, people we lose our identity as a Seventh Day Adventist Church. But the risk of not doing that is greater because if we are refusing to look at our doctrinal positions, if we are refusing to look at how we uh, interpret certain passages of Scripture, then we risk to become a museum and uh, where people come to visit but not really uh, find ways of enriching their lives. Do we need changes in doctrine? Do we need changes in worship? Well, it's impossible in uh, this short uh, presentation to really deal with that in depth. But uh, we, uh, we need in many places to re-emphasize the fact that worship has to do with not worshiping and serving ourselves, but serving God. Uh, too often, worship has become a kind of pious entertainment uh, and not really the kind of thing that it is supposed to be uh, giving honor and glory to God. But having said that, uh, worship should be in culturally relevant forms for all segments of the church, for all age groups of the church. And uh, in many ways, in many parts of the world, we have a long way to go in order to make worship culturally relevant. Uh, it is more and more important, I think, for many people that they see the right kind of rites and rituals. It appears that although people become secular, they still need rituals uh, and are looking for rituals, rituals at critical points in, our, in their lives. The worship of our church should not only focus on the old folks that are there uh, and have been there for the last 30 or 40 years, but also on those whom we refer to as seekers and those who are younger in years. And let's be open to experimentation in our worship. And first of all, more than ever anything else, ensure depth. No dumbing down. And, well, that's a different story, but there is a place for social media and online services, and we ought in many places to explore that further. Changing our doctrines, changing our worship, maybe changing our standards. Uh, research has indicating that relaxing moral standards does not produce growth in the church. That has been proven uh, in many denominations that relaxing standards is not the answer to church growth. But it is important, and uh, that is certainly true for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that there should be a greater emphasis on principles rather than on rules. We have rules in the church. They are uh, supported by statements in the church manual and in the policy books and so on. But ch things Conditions differ around the world, uh, cultures differ around the world, and it's important that we have principles that can be applied in different ways according to different cultures, and that maybe some things have to do more with taste than with actually being right or wrong. For 
our church today, the topic of good stewardship is uh, probably more important than most other things. Uh, stewardship in uh, Adventism has been dealing with a number of areas without actually looking at what the world today looks like. We talk about health, we talk about tithing, we don't talk very much about climate, we don't very much talk about other areas where Christian stewardship is important. And this is something I believe that certainly the younger generation is looking for, that we uh, re uh, study where stewardship is, uh, is, is most relevant and most important. It is, I think, important to recognize that there is going to be diversity. We are all at different stages of spiritual truth and that we fight hypocrisy. If there's anything that pushes young people away from our church, it is the fact that they see many people doing things that are totally contrary to what they say uh, and that their deeds do not correspond with what they what they what they say well i think that i have well i'm close to talking already for about an hour so i'm going to try to wind up things a bit uh changes in communication and witness we must focus on things that truly matter uh but and that is true for all levels of the church allow for questions and dialogue and also allow for diversity in our publications that is unfortunately today not the case it's very difficult sometimes to get books and other things published through the regular channels because there is a very close watch that everything is kosher but in order to grow together and to develop together we need possibilities of actually dialoguing uh, not only in word in, in in spoken word but also in written word uh, it is also important that we do more in terms of evaluating the impact of our methods and our products now there's a lot of talk at the moment in the church about distributing uh, a billion copies of the book the great controversy and uh, so far i understand about 50 million have been uh, distributed but i have not seen anywhere uh, a study an evaluation of what actually this method of distributing products does how many people read these books how many people throw them away how many people are are irritated by it it seems that the the idea that we must just do it be active we have a program let's implement it uh, that is good enough without worrying about the impact and that is something where we must really change in the way we uh, we do things it's important for us to avoid the argon many of our publications of uh, uh, and our visual uh, uh, things they are just uh, very difficult to understand for people who do not know the adventist uh, jargon and uh, we see many often that we utilize the newest technology but that what we try to communicate is uh, not quite as up to date as the uh, media the technology that we use and that uh, there is a lot to be desired when it comes to contextualization and putting things in the context of the 21st century
when we talk about contextualization, it is not just something that we uh, that 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 is important in a mission context in areas of the world that uh, are not uh, part of the Western world, but it is important that we do that all the time, also within the cultural context where we find ourselves. When we look at the Bible, and we have no time now to develop that, but this has always been happening, that the truth, the content, the core of things uh, were put in forms that were were, were uh, relevant for the time in which the message was, was given. We see that in the customs of the patriarchal period. It was things were adopted to the customs of the patriarchs. Uh, it's fascinating to see how the Ten Commandments, how they uh, uh, were similar to the Hittite uh, um, contracts with, uh, with, with other nations, uh, rules that governed the uh, um, relationship between the Hittite king and uh, uh, the other uh, nations that were a part of the Hittite kingdom and the rules between the various groups that had been uh, uh, conquered by the Hittites. And so we can go on. There are things in the Bible, many things in the Bible, that, uh, yes, the, the content uh, has been uh, adapted to the uh, cultural and historical situation of the times in which the message was given. And that is something we should keep in mind when we try to bring our message in the 21st century. We could go on uh, with, do we need changes in organization? Well, uh, why we, we, we need to be critical and take a look at, look at ourselves and ask ourselves, we do certain things, why do we do them? Why do we do them the way we do them? And uh, we must, must have the courage to change if necessary. One of the questions, do we need five levels of uh, church organization? Could we not do with one less or two less? What about the kind of leadership style, which is very American, sorry if that I say this, uh, the, the presidential system that we have, is that what we want to keep? And uh, so there are many questions with regard to organization. Finally, changes may be in spirituality. Should we not give more attention to spiritual growth rather than just numerical growth and uh, no longer play the, uh, the, uh, the game of, of, of numbers? Should we not go for more balance between reflection and action? And so there are other areas in our uh, spirituality uh, the right approach to Ellen G. White is one of them uh, that uh, we might uh, we might consider. How do we change? It's sometimes difficult to convince the people that we need to change. It takes planning. You need to have clear goals. Seek for broad broad participation. And everything, it should always be on a spiritual basis why we do this, building the body of Christ in this world. And, uh, well, I'm not going to say much about change management, but it needs people also who understand how change is brought about, how you build change, and uh, how gradually change can become reality. So, in summary, uh, if we want change, we must understand the processes of change, create a vision, share a vision, and uh, work consciously for change. That means have a plan, 
deal with practical aspects and focus on spiritual aspects. For leaders, it's important to guide in the direction. Also, with regard to the speed of change, you cannot go so quickly uh, and be so far ahead of the troops that they no longer see you as a, uh, a leader. It's important that we learn from our mistakes in the past, but that we never give up. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the basis for our discussion. And when I look at my watch, it is uh, exactly an hour. It's half past, what is it, half past eight. And so I'm going back to uh, to our uh, moderator. Let me see. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brinsma. You have uh, covered a lot of territory in a brief time. And uh, you've opened uh, windows to a whole lot of issues. Uh, I have a number of questions myself, but I'm going to hold off and uh, honor the ones whose hands are raised. And if you uh, have a question, have a comment, an observation, uh, please raise your electronic hand and we will uh, get you in time. Uh, so to uh, begin the questions, uh, Bjorn, you are uh, head of the list. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. And uh, thank you, Dr. Brinsma. That was uh, awesome, as usual. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just like Raj. I have, I have a million questions, but I'm gonna I'm gonna discipline myself for one. Before I come with that question, though, uh, I wouldn't be doing my job without reannouncing Giving Tuesday. This Tuesday is uh, the big kickoff for our year-end fundraiser. Uh, so please, please uh, hold off on giving right now, but give on Giving Tuesday. This Tuesday, the 28th of November, uh, that kicks off our year-end fundraiser. And again, it's like Black Friday for nonprofits. So it's a great time to uh, show your appreciation for AT and keep us going and growing. So uh, thank you for letting me slip in that uh, commercial there. Uh, okay, so here's my here's my question. Um, uh, we've been talking recently, like my, my pet peeve with us progressives is that we're great at complaining. We're great at deconstructing. We're great at saying everything that's wrong with Adventism and Ted Wilson and the GC, et cetera. But we're a lot worse at coming up with any good alternatives. You know what I mean? So uh, often younger people are, are very bored by progressives because, because you know, you see them as critics. Uh, and so they, they want something that they can get behind and, and champion something exciting, something bold. And that's often when uh, downright sort of fundamentalist groups uh, capture young people. And that happens even here in the UK. Uh, and it's a little bit frightening because um, you have these sort of fundamentalist young groups, uh, waves of happiness coming up. So I'm wondering, you know, how, how we can uh, start championing positive alternatives. And Rebecca Barcelo, our news editor, uh, has said more than once in our content meetings at AT that uh, while, you know, the, the young people and, and other generations, and for example, North American Adventism, have been, have been saying that uh, Adventism is crumbling for, for years now, right? Um, and because they haven't been listened to, they've, they've been quietly building alternatives. Um, and her theory is that when when it actually does crumble, when when the when what is right now actually does crumble just by necessity, um, it will it will reveal what has been quietly built. Uh, so she believes that there's there's an alternative Adventism that's currently being built. It just doesn't have the megaphone yet. Um, uh, one quick example of that is uh, ASI, for example, is to me is very boring, very passe, very. It's just full of of kind of. Uh, ministries that are looking for big donors and and not making not making much of an impact anymore. But um, there's this thing called Hive that's very it's it's uh, it's kind of underground. Uh, it's like an alternative to ASI. It's basically Shark Tank. If you guys have heard of this, uh, Shark Tank for Adventists. It's like venture capitalists giving money to Adventist entrepreneurs to go do interesting missional or just like do gooder stuff. Uh, and that has been quietly building and, and was just had a big thing in uh, Colombia this past week where the top prize was $12 million, $12 million to an Adventist entrepreneur 
The second prize was $8 million. I don't know. But this gets no megaphone from the church because it's not in line with, with uh, what the bureaucracy wants. So I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Brins, are, are you seeing examples of uh, interesting alternatives to Adventism that are being built by progressives or just, you know, uh, younger generations in general that are there, but are perhaps just not getting the megaphone? And there, there might be hope that they, they will reveal themselves when, when it all crumbles. Well, I'm not seeing many of those, uh, to be honest. Fair enough. Of course, uh, where I am uh, in uh, a small part of our church in Western Europe, many of the things that happen elsewhere in the world simply escape me. And uh, I'm no longer part of uh, the uh, church organization as I used to be in years past. But no, uh, I am uh, I'm not seeing many of these uh, these um, uh, initiatives. The problem, as you also implied, is that the church is really not giving much uh, possibility, uh, much uh -huh. uh, everything has to be done in a certain way. Uh, we just had the uh, the annual council, and uh, I've tried to follow it a bit from uh, from a distance. But there are plans again for our outreach in the coming years. But it's all much of the same thing, just with some different words. And it's all being uh, pushed from the top downwards to uh, other organizations. What we need is more freedom, uh, mm -hmm. more openness to actually try things. Uh, also, the willingness to accept actually that things are changing. There is a kind of process going on. And we need to acknowledge that process as something that is natural rather than trying to stop it by all kinds of measures. Now, but, uh, on the doc doctrinal scene, there is a doctrine of the investigative judgment, for instance. Uh -huh. Now, we are losing that doctrine if we are if we are honest. Yes. Uh, even in the uh, in the survey that uh, that uh, David Trim uh, led, there was at least one third of membership worldwide. Uh, well, just on the supposition that uh, actually the people understand what it's all about in the investigative judgment, but only two thirds said that they were fully convinced of the doctrine of the investigative judgment. I think it's it's probably closer to the truth to say that the majority in the church have no idea anymore. So right. that, that's a natural progress. We have had that teaching and it has always been surrounded with a lot of difficulties and a lot of, 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 of questions. And so it's a natural process that that would gradually disappear from the scene. That is a process that you also see in many other denominations that happens with certain of their doctrines. We must acknowledge that rather than to put up a fight and to say to people that if you no longer believe that, well, then you're really not a true Seventh-day Adventist. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, the the kind of openness that we need in order for our church to come through this impasse in which we are, we currently are. Uh, the willingness also from the top to really discuss possibilities of uh, reorganizing our system and uh, and make it more acceptable to uh, at least the Western world. Now, we just saw the president of the General Conference traveling through, uh, through Nigeria. I don't know whether you have followed it. Uh, he was flown around by a private with a private plane, I saw. And, uh, and he was uh, 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 welcomed 
as if he was the fourth person of the Trinity. Uh, but really, that is something that, that, that no longer works for most of us in the Western world. And so if he and people around him do not realize that, then uh, uh, something will have to go. And, and the prestige of uh, that type of leadership is, uh, is vastly disappearing. So, um, well, Bjorn, <laughs> I'm going a bit in, in circles maybe, but, but I believe that we need a breakthrough on some of these, uh, uh, in some of these things in order to, uh, to give the credibility of our organization back to, in particular, the young people of the church. Thank you. Thank so that, you. That, that's, that's encouraging. Thank you. All right, Horace, uh, you are next. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bruzma, for that beautiful exposition on, on change. Those of us who have served within the organization are pro probably still serving within the organization, always face a dilemma. And that dilemma is, how do we survive long enough within the organization to effect some change without ourselves being changed and compromised in the process of so doing? Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for us? I, I can see what you mean. Uh, and of course, I've also worked in, in, the, in the system for over 40 years. Um, I have been surprised, however, uh, that where I have worked, that it has been possible to remain who I am and be authentic. And as I have said before, also in this forum, you don't need to be stupid as a leader, uh, uh, saying everything you think all the time, in every place, at every occasion. But with, if you try to be a little bit tactical, have some tact, and also preferably have some humor, you can actually say quite a bit. And I hope that those who have followed me a little bit over the years have felt that I have always tried to remain true to myself. And that has meant that maybe I have not been elected to certain positions. Uh, that means maybe that I've not been in certain committees but I have been able to make a contribution to it to the church and do something meaningful for quite a few people, I believe. And so I see so many uh, fellow leaders and current leaders in the church who just don't speak up and uh, they're afraid, and there is a climate of, uh, of, of fear often in the church. If I do say this, then I'm going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. But we have to break through that fear. We must not be afraid to speak up. Uh, do it wisely, uh, maybe in a wise doses, but that people see that what we say, this is what we actually believe. This is not what we just say in order, because it's expected of us to say. And young people in particular, but I don't think it's only young people, they are uh, just frustrated by the fact that they talk to many people face to face and they hear one story and then they see the person 
on the pulpit and they hear a totally different story. And, and that is fatal for their uh, trust in the church's leadership and, uh, and the way the church functions. So if there's anything that, that, that must change, it is that we are who we are. We dare to be who we are. And, uh, you know, even when it comes to doctrines, uh, when we look at the uh, at creation in six days, I have very few friends in the church, colleagues in the church, who actually believe that. Mm -hmm. But they say, we can't say that, because then we are in trouble. No, yeah. must say that. We must have the courage to say that. Most people in the church will appreciate that if we are honest. And uh, and and I think that will go quite a way to solving some of the distrust that there is. We say one thing, we do something else. Let me just tell you that when I used to go to the to the general conference building for meetings, uh, I would. Uh, know many people in the in the various offices and i would find many places in the general conference office where i could have my cup of coffee at 11 o'clock in the morning as every dutch person must have and i thought it was quite a funny that in that building where you know there is uh, uh, a constant campaign to keep Starbucks away uh, <laughs> that that I would actually be able to find at least 10 places in that building where uh, I would have my cup. Now, I told that story once coming back from the States to my daughter, and she did not laugh, but she felt that that was disgusting. And she said, that is what is wrong with the church. They uh, they say something, but they do something else. It's just hypocritical. And many of the studies that have been done about church leaving have shown that the accusation of being hypocritical is one of the key uh, issues when it comes to church leaving. So, well, talking about a lot of things that must change, and maybe as I was talking, I thought, well, I'm trying to cover far too much territory in just one hour. But beyond all that change is that we must be uh, be willing to uh, to be authentic, and, uh, and 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 people must what you see is what you get, uh, and well, that. A long way and then dialogue uh, opportunities to actually talk together various groups various viewpoints and that will go a long way in helping to see that in spite of our differences we have much more in common than we sometimes think and uh, that will go a long way to helping uh, making people respect one another and listening to one another. Well, yeah. Well, thank you so much for that response, Dr. Brunsma. But yeah. for, some, for some reason, I'm a little bit pessimistic when I think about the experience of Jesus who tried to reform Judaism and in the process discovered that that task was not feasible and mm -hmm. we ended up with a different christian religion which kind of goes back to what bjorn was alluding to in his question about parallel movements within adventism that may allow for some believers to have a home in which they're comfortable spiritually mm -hmm. yeah uh i think we all have moments of pessimism 
Um, well, maybe not all, but many of us. And I have uh, personally moments of pessimism. You see things happening in the church worldwide. You see things happening in the church, church near to you, in your own union, in your own conference. It makes you pessimistic. But at the same time, I continue to see also some good things in the church. And uh, I also feel that, uh, well, after a day like this, for instance, when I've been able to go out preaching, have been able to, uh, to, to dialogue with quite a few people, uh, I feel encouraged seeing there are so many nice people in the church who are true believers and uh, who are not tainted by all this extremism that you see sometimes at the fringes of the church. So I'm not totally pessimistic. Uh, I also realize that churches, movements, organizations go through cycles. And it may well be that we are in a somewhat downward phase of our movement, that something needs to happen and will happen to shake us up. Um, when there are parallel organizations, uh, some of them will be uh, on the fringes, will be fundamentalist, but when there are also parallel organizations that give openness, you know, even uh, this Adventist Today's Sabbath seminar is a city of refuge where people can come and feel that there are still 7,000 who have not knelt for the Baal. And there are still, uh, uh, there are others that you feel akin to. So, um, and then, you know, also on a personal level, sometimes, you know, you wonder what have you done in your 40 years plus of ministry? What have you achieved? But then there are all the time people that tell you, well, you know, what you said then and that it made a difference for me. Uh, something that I read that you wrote uh, that really was important to me. Uh, and so my, my pessimism is somewhat mitigated at least by uh, by some of the good things that I see, and uh, that gives me continues to give me the courage and 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 the the the, the, the perseverance to uh, to do my best, uh, even you know in the little that uh, that that I can accomplish. Did I answer the question, or was I just going on about something? No, that was good. Thank you. Very good. Uh, George, it's your turn, my friend. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Ryder. Thank you again for this presentation. I always enjoy your presentations, as you know. And I won't repeat myself here. You know my opinions about many things. But you wrote a, a powerful article in this last issue of Adventist Today, the magazine. I got the PDF version, so I was able to, to listen to it because I can no longer read it. But, um, and, and it was very powerful, was very interesting, very attractive. So that's one pathway, the pathway of reforming the structure. And as we you indicated this morning, there are many other pathways. One would be the leadership, another is the doctrinal and many others. The thing is, the difficulty of will be if we take one pathway and reform that issue first, and then another pathway, or the reform should go at the same time uh, for all of them. 
Uh, I personally don't see how to reform the Adventist church. You, you know that. We discussed this before. Mm -hmm. Because I don't care about the structure. I don't care about the leadership who is on the top. I only care about what hit me the most, which was the, the doctrinal issue. I spent 16 years in our schools. I got a degree in theology in college and everything. And uh, a few years later, you know, uh, Glacier View hit, and I learned many things since. And so I don't even consider myself being an Adventist because the doctrines uh, uh, need to be reformed or else. So can we have two churches in the same church? Can we have the pro uh, progressives and the conservatives at the same time uh, surviving together? Did it ever happen in history? I don't think so. There was always a new movement, a split, a new organization. So uh, what is your intuition? Do you really believe that the denomination can be, can be adjusted and changed doctrinally? Because as I said, I don't care about the structure. If that wish is there, it doesn't affect me. If there are unions and divisions and conferences, it doesn't affect me. The only thing that affects me is, uh, and it's a personal thing, is doctrinal because the, the hypocrisy and the hiding of information from members, all that happened, that's not acceptable. That cannot be part of a religious movement. Mm -hmm. So how do we handle this? There is about five questions that you're asking, uh, George. Pick one. <laughs> and um, I think that change can happen. But in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you probably need a crisis before change will actually happen. We need to run out of money before we change the organizational structure, I think. Uh, when you have a crisis, then new leadership may emerge, new ideas may become possible that were not contemplated before can you have the a difference of opinions in the same church well when you look at other denominations then you see that some denominations have not been able to keep different uh, ideas together and they have pilferated they have fragmented in uh, different groups but there have also been denominations that have had the possibility of staying together and yet have a way of dealing with different uh, streams. And the best example is the Roman Catholic Church. You know, the Mo Roman Catholic Church is not monolithic uh, doctrinally. Yes, they have a pope. And they have a particular system that is very similar to ours. But somehow within that church, very different groups are accommodated quite successfully. And, uh, and there are other churches. Actually, in my own country, you had a Dutch Reformed church where you had uh, communities, congregations that were quite liberal. And you had some that were quite conservative, but they were able to stay together in the same denomination quite successfully. But, but none of them had a prophet, and that's a major problem. We are yes. not sola scriptura or prima scriptura. We are and, Ellen White scriptura. So those your, organizations didn't have this problem. You are right that having Ellen White is something special that uh, that has enriched us or provided us Sorry. lots of problems but you know i am i'm optimistic that sooner or later and rather sooner than later the church will have to face 
the issue of Ellen White, and will have to say to to give a more, uh, uh, let's say uh, a more. Um, what do you say? Satisfactory, Satisfactory yes, uh, responsible uh, of uh, of Alan White. I was encouraged to see this group of scholars coming together a couple of weeks ago and talking about the role of Alan White. Uh, it looks to me that the time is near that the church will have to face these questions and will have to do something about it. And uh, uh, but yeah, that is that that is an issue that the church will have to face. Thank you, uh, Randy. You mentioned that uh, one of the things that might precipitate change is a financial crisis or a financial downturn. Uh, I think many have held that view for years, uh, and despite all that's going on, it seems like somehow the church is able to maintain its finances. I looked at uh, the NAD year-end meeting report, uh, financial report, and they claim tithe in this division is up 9%, and that all but one conference in this uh, division is showing tithe increase. So, uh, you know, some of us I actually expected that tithe would go down uh, because of all the dissatisfaction there is and all the issues we've talked about. But for some mysterious reason, and I, I, I have no explanation for it, uh, tithe has gone up and is going up. So uh, I don't know how long we will wait for a financial crisis, but it doesn't seem to be happening. Well, I, I would like to see a H breakdown as far as tithe paying is concerned. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I would think that uh, most of that in increase is... Uh, coming from a group of members that is doing quite well financially, and that is the group to which most of us uh, belong, the pensioners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're right on that. I, I, I believe that. Okay, Lauren, I think you're next. This has been a very fascinating discussion. And uh, you, you pretty much have uh, covered, well, Reinder, you covered so many topics, it's hard to even know. Uh, I, I know you're not supposed to make generalizations, but uh, for me, at least, I'll, I'll make a generalization. As far as church organized religion goes, I think it's not a very uh, healthy system for people who want to think thoughtfully and clearly. You know, I, I would almost say that it's it's bankrupt in that respect. I, I have, the, what made me think of this, Reinder, is uh, you, you're talking about hypocrisy. And I realized through the years that in the terms that Elder Wilson spells it out, uh, that everybody has to look at things in precisely the same way. Almost all of us are hypocrites. If I had not been a hypocrite in some respect, I could not have continued my my ministry for as long as I did. Mm -hmm. I if I if everything had to be said right out in the open that what I believed in or didn't believe in. Uh, I couldn't have continued my ministry. It, it doesn't work like that. And as I talk to friends in uh, higher areas of the church, all of them are hypocrites. I mean, I have people who call me up and write me notes and say, we love what you're saying in Adventist today, and we don't agree with Elder Wilson. Well, there you go. You work in the same office building as he does, and you don't agree with him. And yet if I say, well, can you say that? Can you write an article for us where you say, oh, no, 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 no. No, we can't say that. Well, I understand. I'm, I'm, I'm not critical, really. I understand. Um, there are a lot of things I didn't say either. I tried to always be conscientious and to love my people, but I didn't tell them what I didn't believe. 
And so as far as looking to the general conference or even, even the Ohio conference for that matter, Raj, with due respect, uh, to, to tell, to uh, provide me a world in which I can fit in without any, uh, any, any hypocrisy at all. Um, I don't, I don't expect that of organized religion. And in fact, one of the biggest problems that we talk about in our Adventist Today meetings, particularly in our content meeting on Monday, and we've, we've brought this up many times, how do you continue to be positive and upbuilding while at the same time having to be, by the very nature of the thing, critical? How do you do that? Now I'm I'm retired, so I can I can say a lot of things I, I didn't say when I was was younger. But I'm still I, there. There are times when I still feel a little bit like a hypocrite, like uh, like I'm I'm trying to be supportive and kind to people, but I do not have good feelings toward the sorts of things that Elder Wilson says. In fact, I was I was hurt, Grinder, by the things that he said in that speech at uh, the last meeting. Because I kept thinking of all the people I know who listened to that speech and said, I don't want anything to do with a church that talks like this, that treats people like this. So I don't know. I'm, I, I somehow want to be, I don't know quite what to say. I'm, I, I somehow want to be a building to the church. I haven't given up on it. I'm still here. I'm still involved in in Seventh Day Adventism, deeply involved, probably more than I ever have been in my life. All of my friends are Seventh Day Adventists. I know uh, the, the the history and the background to every issue that comes up, like you guys do. You know, somebody mentions somebody says, "Oh yeah, I don't know where that started and where that comes from," and I have some of the quotes that go along with it. And, some of the books that caused it. I mean, we're, we're very, very much involved in it. I, I, I could no longer walk away from it in a sense than I could from my biological family. But at the same time, I'm not, I, I'm trying to find a way of, of, of being positive, of being hopeful, of, uh, I, I guess I'll have to continue to be a hypocrite in some ways, but of being hopeful and, and, and saying, yeah, we can create something better than we have if we stick with this and pr pass it down to, to uh, younger people and others will find, will, will take at least the bones of what, of, of what was good and make something good out of it on into the future. That's my, that's my two cents. I think it's good that you uh, put some nuance to what I just said, because, of course, that is true for all of us, that in a way, even though we try to be open, we do not say everything and we are careful. And uh, we also don't want to shock certain of our, our people in our congregations out of pastoral care also. That's right. Uh, but I think that... Uh, People who have followed you, and that is true for quite a few people, have seen that you have been struggling with these things. And many of our members understand the role of the pastor and that they are in a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, what was it? Wasn't it uh, Henry J. Abnowen, I think, wrote a book called The Wounded Healer? Do you remember that? Yeah. And and I, I, I remember being touched by that, that uh, the, the pastor, he says, or the chaplain, uh, lives out in his own struggles, uh, the difficulties that the people he's ministering to. And I suppose I have done some of that, but I've also kept a lot of it to myself, too, and just ministered to people like you, probably, when somebody comes up to me and says, says the the 1844 and the Catholic persecution is the most important thing to me. I don't argue with them. Do you? No, I just go, okay. That's, uh, and, and uh, I just say, well, let's, let's praise Jesus that he gave you those truths. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
you know, what do you, what do you do? How do you, how do you create something new out of the, uh, what is to me, oh, by the way, one more thing I should say too, uh, Reinder, and you, you will probably agree with this as well. And that is that the, the description that you gave and that I just gave is very much true of a certain subset of us in the church. Is that true of everybody? Uh, you, you you go to places like the Philippines and the young people are excited about their church. Uh, there it's there's a, a different a different thing going on, and so that's another question that comes up. Then you say, well, do I have the right to go around pulling pulling the rug out from under them if they're happy with it? Why should I be going around saying, oh no, it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't work? Um, you know, it, it's a hard thing to find. At the same time, uh, Lauren, uh, even in uh, many of these countries, we find that many of the uh, the uh, developments that we have seen in the Western world are showing up there. Interesting. Uh, and uh, we 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 see, for instance, when when you look at immigrant societies that have come to the Western world, groups of immigrants, first generation is different from the second and third generation in that group. And uh, I see that in immigrant groups in my country, that when it comes to the second and the third generation, you have many of the same issues that, uh, that, that we find in the uh, original Dutch uh, society. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I remember once uh, being a month in, uh, in, in Uganda and teaching at Bugema University there. And I had been doing quite a bit on modernism and postmodernism in other places. And these students there said, why don't you talk to us about this? And, and you know, and they said, you know, we also have internet. We also know what's going on in the world. So please, you know, take some time and talk to us about that. And that was a great lesson for me. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, I, I think you're you're probably right. Have you ever noticed that who, there, there's sort of a, an almost an unspoken assumption that you get from when you talk to somebody at the general conference that overseas, they're all happy. They mm -hmm. love the, the, the traditional... They never argue about everything. They pay their tithe. They love the traditional teachings. It's only you people here in North America and Europe and Australia that are so bad. And maybe that's not actually true, Reiner. <laughs> maybe maybe well, they're, uh, maybe they're true, struggling just like we do. If that were true, that they were all happy, why did we write off a million members in South America? Because they are no longer there. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ed Zuckwitz, you are next, please. Hi, thank you for addressing this uh, uh, qu uh, question or um, issue. I mean, it's been a long-standing one, certainly on this program. Now, I want to tell a little story before I get into what I want to say. And that is um, a number of years ago, uh, the... Um, I forget which conference was having a camp meeting in Eastern Canada, the Atlantic Conference, uh, or I think it was. And they brought in, uh, this was at Camp Pugwash, and they had on their camp meeting agenda uh, the topic of conversion therapy. Okay. Convincing gay people that they could become normal again. Well, that hit the... Uh, got the attention of the newspaper in Pugwash at uh, a small uh, town or a large town uh, not too far away from the where the camp meeting was, I think about 10 kilometers. And after it hit the news, it, it the news spread and those people that were coming to the camp meeting were canceled because uh, it made the church look pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, the reason I bring that up is I want to introduce the idea of accountability. So in politics, for example, elections, 
when you know they come up every so often and everybody gets to vote and in between people get to protest the media like and that's why i told the story the media can come along and uh, bring up issues and hold the government to account or the elected officials or whatever now i know the church isn't uh, there are so many different churches so in that sense regular media wouldn't cover what's going on in churches unless there was a lot of abuse or some topics that got people's attention. But the there, there's a saying I've, I've heard that change can be quick. It's getting ready for the change or preparing for the change that takes a long time. So uh, the, the question I have has to do with accountability. So when you look at the accountability that can be in public life, elected officials, democracy, so to speak, when you look at the structure of the church, it's not designed to change. It's designed to keep the status quo. So the question is, how do we introduce accountability? How do we introduce uh, the desire amongst um, conferences or churches or whatever even to have surveys and say hey how are we doing what what's on your mind what do you want to happy about how do we get media that isn't governed or owned by the church i mean this adventist today is a media platform that in a very tiny way when you look at the whole church can create some accountability but if we had adventist today um branches, so to speak, in all conferences or areas around the world, holding the church to account, then may maybe there would be uh, the possibility of change much sooner. So anyways, that's the question. How do we introduce accountability? Because it's shown that accountability in other parts of society can be very effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say that probably the role of uh, Adventist today and of spectrum is uh, much bigger than uh, some of us think. Uh, the, these uh, these uh, two channels, uh, they uh, they are followed, I think, by uh, by the regular by the by the church officials and uh, at at different levels. Uh, I'm surprised often to find that when you talk to people one-to-one, -one, that they are very knowledgeable about what uh, these uh, two channels uh, actually uh, uh, report. So uh, let's uh, support Bjorn in his uh, fundraising uh, activity and uh, help Adventists today to grow also, there is some uh, effort to be international in different languages. Uh, maybe there's a long way to go, but the influence is, uh, is, is very significant, I think, already. But yes, more needs to be done. And um, yeah, what can, what some of us can do something maybe at the local level, in writing for some of our local uh, papers, and uh, and ask them to be a little bit more uh, daring in uh, in what they publish, but accountability that is certainly true. And, mm -hmm. uh, we have all kinds of plans that are pushed down from above, but uh, there is very little. Uh, 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 let's see, evaluation and reporting as to what has actually been accomplished. A couple of years ago, uh, we had already a campaign to uh, distribute millions of copies of the Great Controversy. We have never heard any report. That doesn't seem to be important as long as we do the job, uh, but we should insist and maybe inspire more of our delegates to, who go to uh, to session to ask questions about it. Now, what actually happened? Has this had any success? And uh, 
you know the recent, and you may have seen the two pieces that uh, that I wrote for uh, for um, uh, uh, Adventist Today about the campaign in Europe and about uh, the campaign of Elder Wilson in Prague. Now, uh, well, uh, I think that uh, that Adventist Today is committed to to doing that kind of thing, and. Uh, uh, it was not easy to get uh, people at the GC to talk about these things, and uh, certainly not uh, not on the record. But if we pursue these things and bring them out in the open, that will have an influence, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, it, it might be interesting, uh, Bjorn and Lauren, for this group to know uh, what the reach of Adventist today is uh, right now, you know, the uh, languages and uh, maybe the readership. Can you give us a, a little thumbnail sketch on that uh, just for our interest? Yeah, Lauren, Lauren and I can probably tag team on that, but um, the uh, the website does quite well. We often have about 100,000 uh, a month, which is, which is good for... Um, for what you know, for our size currently, I would say it's it's a, it's a good uh, reach, uh, in comparison to, in comparison to the reach of other other Adventist entities. We, we've uh, we're about neck and neck with the review. I remember we were looking at this uh, uh, towards the beginning of the year, and uh, so um, and and Spectrum, we were within striking distance. I think Spectrum is a little bit bigger. Um, quite a lot of social media reach, a very large uh, active Facebook page, uh, 22,000 or so members, uh, followers there. Uh, and the magazine has a growing subscription. I'd, I'd love to have more. We have about 2,300 people uh, subscribed to that. Uh, I'd love to have 10,000, but uh, hey, that's me. Uh, yeah, so it's it's growing. What I would love to see, and, and this we do not have enough of, but is uh, Adventist today uh, in the globe? You know, in, in the in the global South, basically. I, we our, our Latin America director is doing a great job there, um, Daniel Mora, in terms of writing stuff that's relevant to Latin America, and he's making real headway. But uh, I would love to have a Daniel Mora equivalent in Africa, or, you know, or or you know, one in East Africa, one in West Africa. There's so much room in in areas of the church where where um, where there's explosive growth for just you know the kind of uh, journalism dr brent was talking about so yeah i'm i'm really i'm really excited about the future and i and i think um you know where a lot of institutions and a lot of adventist entities are kind of growing and i mean sorry are, are faltering and and losing growth are are, are are um growing smaller entities like at i mean we're we're finally seeing growth you know what i mean so that that is uh i think an encouraging an encouraging indicator for the future that uh, there is a push for transparency. There is a push for open conversation. Uh, people want that, and not just you know in the U.S. It's it's an international thing. Thank you, Lauren. You want to add something? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll I'll give you a little bit for, from the uh, sort of anecdotal point of view. I was not lying when I said that I know uh, dozens of people from the Silver Spring office, who regularly read Adventist Today. Now, there might be some of them who read it to, to click their tongues over how, how bad we are, but I think for the most part, I think they're appreciative. The ones who talk to me and, and tell me, I'm, I'm actually kind of astonished at the number of very positive interactions I have. Uh, people who will come up to me, and <laughs> I remember a few years ago, uh, one guy came up to me and walked up to me and said, are you Lauren Seibold? I said, yeah. He said, and he did it behind his hand and he said, kind of quietly, he said, we all read your stuff here. <laughs> I, it, it really encouraged me. It made me feel good. And uh, I still think of that very often, that sometimes your reach is not reflected only by the people who tell you these things. There are a lot of people who are reading it. Also, I, I just mentioned this to Bjorn a little while ago, different things appeal to different parts of the world. And uh, one of the places, one of the things that really appeals to people, I, I run the, the email that uh, gets questions for Aunt Sevi. And at least half of our questions come from Africa. 
true story. And uh, that's interesting. And it somehow this, this sense of, of this, even, even though I think it's clear that and the Adventist ant is, is uh, a sort of a composite sort of column, uh, it really appeals to people. And we get lots of, there, there have been times when we, when the, when, when uh, now we could, we can't break this down quite as easily on uh, the website as we can on Facebook. But when we see who is hitting Abbott's today Facebook page, which we assume takes them back to the, to, to, to the website, uh, there have been times when uh, Nairobi and Pretoria and uh, some of these cities are the highest number of people who are hitting the, the uh, Facebook page. This surprised me I, because they don't say anything. Uh, they don't jump in and, and say anything, but they do write to Aunt Sevy. So you'll find that, it, I thought you, you you all would find that a little bit interesting. As I said in the, the, the notes here, our products are, are provided free for everybody. <clears throat> we don't charge. We didn't charge a subscription to get the magazine. We give everything free, but it's not free. Uh, you'd be astonished at how expensive it really is. So, uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm making you feel a little guilty here. I guess I am. Is that okay, Bjorn? Uh, do a little guilting. But yeah, it is, it's expensive. And, and so we, we want to keep this going. Just really do pray for us. Because our desire, and we talk about this all the time, is how can we be both critical and constructive at the same time? I mean, to think about that. That's really hard to do. It, it's, it's a political balancing act. And uh, we have a hard time with it at times. And so we, we work on it. We talk about it. You may have read things on Adventist Kate. You said, oh, that's way over the line. That's just... That was way too critical. And sometimes I feel that way too. I think maybe I, you, I'm being the one that's being too critical on it. And I, I sometimes feel bad and kind of go back and, you know, face palm. What, how, why did I do that? Why did I say that? But uh, for the most part, uh, we're, we're, hitting, we're hitting home runs here, folks. So thank that's you. All. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, that's good to know what the reach is and and how it is it is growing and has room for growth and uh, mm -hmm. everyone's support, of course, is is uh, needed. So uh, we have a, a few more questions. Uh, Bob, it's yeah. your turn. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Raj and uh, Dr. Burisma. Thank you. A very profound um, presentation. In fact. You know these these are the issues that should be that should preoccupy the folks in Silver Springs, as far as I'm concerned. So it goes to the heart of Adventism. And by the way, um, Lauren on Sevi, I love the on Sevi um, columns, and I think it's um, I always find them very noteworthy because they had. I'm not surprised many of the questions may come from the global south or the third world because those are. Um, many questions I myself have had over time have come across and have asked. So I am not, I'm not, I'm certainly not surprised. I love reading on SEVI. And uh, by the way, um, Dr. Burzmer, regarding um, the generational, um, changing generational attitudes um, for those of us immigrants who come to the U.S., you're absolutely on point. Um, my parents, my parents' theology, my parents' um, theology is different from my theology. And um, my, my Gen Z and millennial children, they are two totally different from mine. It's um, way off. In fact, it's, a, it's, on a, it's on a declining role, if you put it that way. So I, I, can, I, can, I can understand that. So... Um, I, my my question is this: that um, in order for any um, substantive change to occur, in terms in terms of examining the profound issues you raised in the presentation, 
and considering considering the um the the skewed geographical sort of application of Adventist theology. Um, if if there is any effort to address these profound issues, um, my thinking is that it may have to come from say outside the general conference, outside of outside of their space, so to speak. But my question is this. First of all, I don't think my friend, well, two questions. One, do you think it will come from them? I don't think so. And secondly, if it does not come from them, do you think such inquiry and such efforts will have, A, will it have legitimacy? Will it have authority? Um, will it be taken seriously? And will it be implementable? Those are my two questions. Um, it may not come from the GC, but it will have to be allowed by the GC. Okay. There must be a certain openness to let things develop and let things happen. And not this, this anxiety that, you know, the church is about to, uh, to lose its way unless they uh, they keep the reins firm uh, well and you know i think that if there is enough happening at the base level of the church mm -hmm. they are going to react and uh, maybe negatively at first but it will bring about change now an example, for instance, is the LGBTQ issue. So much is happening in the church mm -hmm. at lower level, as far as that is concerned, that you can sense that they are panicking. And uh, that maybe is a good thing. And they may do some weird things in order to, uh, to, to try to bring this mm -hmm. under control. Mm -hmm. Maybe a face that we have to go through. But to me, it's clear that something is happening on that account in the church and the GC is not able to... Uh, to, to, uh, sure. to... So, yes, uh, but that's far away from giving permission yet. But somehow some of these things will have to develop and we mentioned the issue of, for instance, the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, whatever the general conference is doing, the doctrinal concern about these things is changing in the church worldwide. So, yes, but it takes time. And uh, it takes time in our church. But when you look at some other churches, uh, there things seem to take even more time. I believe in the uh, in the Eastern Church there is a commission that has been meeting now yearly for about seventy years about the date of Easter. So yes, things do take time, and yes. uh, I don't know whether that gives any answer, but trying. Yeah, I think you may be onto something. In fact, one quick note um, again. Growing up as a child into adulthood, um, pastors usually, they, they sometimes they won't even quote a, a name. They'll just say, the spirit of prophecy says. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, the, 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 the prophetess says. I've seen that, and I've now seen that evolve to, then it went into Ellen White, the prophetess, or the, the, the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, or the, the the spirit of prophecy. Then I've seen the mo the, the most recent um, iteration of that is um, my favorite author. My favorite author says, or um, um, an author who was influenced by the spirit says, but is no longer the um, the 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 slogan the spirit of prophecy or the lord's servant etc they are sort of subtle distancing so i think again coming up from the ground maybe it will evolve like this thank you yeah 
Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Good, good question. Good comment. Okay, uh, Gerald, please. Thank you, Raj, um, and thank you, Reinder. Uh, thank you for bringing this up and allowing us to look at it. I'm going to introduce a little angle that it occurs to me might be appropriate. Um, this morning, I taught my youth the difference between consent and honor. And of course, to them, it was more about sex. But I told them it had a lot to do with religion and everything else in life, that God honors our choices and demands our consent. Otherwise, it's spiritual rape. And I don't think God's that kind of a person. So humor me, but is it possible that there is an essential progression of congregational encouragement, essential to any man's eventual conversion, that will allow them when God truly does come, whether it's soon or late, they all can look up in the sky and say in unison, this is our God. We've waited for him. Mm -hmm. Now, I told my youth, God loves you all. He loves you and he loves you. Please don't be jealous. There's enough love to go around. I think that it's essential that we take care of reprimanding beliefs or systems which would defeat the important issues. We have to argue in those stances. Mm -hmm. But overall, perhaps having Adventist today, the Seventh-day Adventist church, um, the reformed Juda Judaism uh, that I saw an article about this morning, um, the Catholic church um, are all essential stepping stones for those whom God truly loves and will look forward to rescuing. Well, that's not much of a question, but that is more of a comment that I heartily agree with. And in connection with that, I think that we have probably seen a, a kind of development that is very gradual, but it's there. And that the COVID period has really been important as far as that is concerned. In many parts of the world, I think uh, there is much more attention and emphasis on the role of the local church hmm. than was before. And in many parts of the world, we have seen, of people have seen during the COVID period, that actually the church can continue to run even if the people from Silver Spring are not around and visiting. And if many of the things that the corporate church used to do are no longer happening, there were initiatives also at the local level that are now continuing. So, um, uh, and although I think we, uh, we realize that we would like to stay together. We would not go for a completely congregational system that we'd like to have, at least I do, have some umbrella, but yet coming more to the, you know, to actually emphasize what we have been giving lip service to, that the local church is the essential building block. And at the local church level, we can change some things. We don't have to wait till it's being done in the conference or certainly not for the division or, or the GC. And in a local church also, uh, you can maybe manage better the, uh, the diversity in theological opinion and actually create an environment where you can dialogue and where you can respect one another uh, in spite of uh, differences. And I like the idea that, yes, there is enough uh, love from God going around that we don't have to be jealous and say, <laughs> we are the ones and the others are totally wrong. Thank right. you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. And I think that there may be a place in this, this concept of defending the faith of being a good Roman Catholic, 
of being a good Jew, of being a good Seventh-day Adventist, because if you don't keep your place, there's no firm foundation for the next footstep mm-hmm. of the growing individual. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ed, please ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think history would indicate to us that large scale change stemming from let's say the general conference is really not likely. Um, The general conference exists to protect. I actually think there's a lot of fear at the general conference that they'll lose, that things will get out of hand. Mm -hmm. I bet Ted Wilson's even afraid. Uh, And so he deals with that in his own way. You know, I've forgotten when it was, maybe in the 70s or 80s, Chrysler was in trouble. And they hired a guy named Lee Iacocca. And we saw Iacocca on TV all the time, pushing Chrysler vehicles. Well, Lee Iacocca was a study in leading change because he not only sold a lot of cars on television, he transformed the company. And Iacocca was a leader who had a constant drumbeat of a message about where they were going that was different from where they'd been. Well, we're not just covered up with Lee Iacocca's in our church. Um, As a matter of fact, I don't know any Lee Iacocca's in our church who would put out a constant drumbeat of desirable change for our our organization. Um, We are now in the NAD uh, 3% of the worldwide church membership. Um, If we throw in Europe, maybe Australia, we're probably up to four, five, six percent. The big votes are elsewhere. The big preferences about the church are elsewhere. And whoever's standing for election to the general conference is likely to play to those preferences, not ours. Uh, So the organizational change, those of us all, there's now 104 of us on this call would like to see are not likely to come from the top. Uh, As a matter of fact, it might get worse before it gets better. Uh, So what do we do? Well, I think the NAD should, and Europe, should just act more independently. Uh, Our constituency is different than many other constituencies. We need to serve our constituency. Mm-hmm. And probably the NAD will have to be more independent. And I know when you probably go sit in those seats, it feels hard. Uh, but it doesn't feel hard to me and probably not to you. Uh, within the NAD, maybe there's a need for more independence. Um, we're doing that right this afternoon. Uh, this is this is an independent organization, and it's doing its thing, and it's saying things that others might not like to hear. But we're saying it; we're going to say it. And uh, there we go. Um, I think change will come about organically. Small will grow. Uh, Richard Myers put a post in the chat. Oh, 45 minutes ago, and talked about uh, we should can all have our own variations of Adventism and all should be welcome within our fellowship. And that got the most responses of any quote I've seen, any statement I've seen today in the chat. 
And I think that probably reflects the fact that we see ourselves on this call as a big tent. And um, I do for certain. Now I wanna close with, um, Reinder, you said something earlier that AT was like a city of refuge to a lot of people. I wrote that down. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a member of the board and a board officer of Adventist today now. And that, that statement really resonated with me about Adventist today. And I would like to invite you to see yourself as a part of that city of refuge thing uh, and do whatever you can do to help us build and grow the effectiveness of Adventist today, whether it's re recommending things to your, your acquaintances or whether it's through donations or whether it's through writing or whatever, that you can help build this Adventist city of refuge. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just struck me, Ryder, and I thank you for saying that. Mm. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is we need to pursue change in our corner, and our corner is Adventist today. It's pretty tough to boil this ocean, mm -hmm. uh, but we can boil things here at Adventist today and in the other corners where we all live our lives. Thank you. Thank well, you, Ed. Thank Ed. you for these, uh, for these comments. Um, and uh, yeah, I try to be supportive of Adventist today. Um, change must come organically. I think you're right. The NID actually has shown that it can become more independently from what it was. And that is a process that goes maybe too slow, but it can continue. It used to be part of the General Conference, a very special kind of arrangement. It became an independent uh, division. It moved out of the building of the General Conference, which was a very symbolic move. Uh, some institutions have uh, in America have returned to the North American uh, division and uh, you have had leadership and have leadership that, uh, that has another tone to what uh, the general conference has. And so uh, that is, that is very encouraging. And uh, that is a process that can and hopefully will will continue and uh, well this uh, this city of refuge concept maybe we can work on that a little further and 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 develop that thank you very much and and, uh, and thank you thank you Rinba, for your for your blog uh folk if you haven't been reading the brunsma blog on at you should uh, do that and uh we expect that you'll continue to write that, uh, Ranger. The your well, blog, very helpful, very good. I'll do my best. All right. So, um, uh, Lauren, we have about twelve minutes, and we have two hands up. Uh, let me ask you folks to keep it brief. Uh, Doug, uh, before before Doug speaks, let me just say, uh, next week we have one of my my other favorite teachers here. I I don't. All of our teachers are so good. I shouldn't even say that phrase because just one after the other is so good. But uh, somebody who's taught for us quite frequently is Olive Hemmings. And, you know, this strong emphasis on righteousness as justice. Uh, she does such a beautiful job and she's teaching for us next week. So just wanted to let you know, she hasn't given me a precise topic, but I know she's listening here and maybe she will. Uh, write it in the in, in the comments but yeah olive is fantastic i'm a huge fan of olive hemmings and i think most of our our class members are so looking forward to that uh doug go ahead i'm sorry to interrupt you no no worries and uh thank you dr brunsma for your presentation and and for all the people that have contributed along the way 
I continue to regard AT as as that city of refuge, but it's not the only one. Um, and so I wrote a letter that uh, is only three paragraphs. It was addressed to uh, the president of the Pacific Union, the Southern California Conference. And it says, greetings and thank you. I am writing to express my appreciation for the opportunity to be among the constituents as a new member of the congregation of Glendale City Church. Though my wife and I continue to reside in Oregon, we gave considerable thought to where our membership should be, if anywhere, before joining Glendale. As a church that truly welcomes all, we have chosen to be a part of Glendale even if necessarily from this distance, we value Glendale's an affirming congregation. We hope that Glendale has your complete and continued support in doing so. It is our objective to aid Glendale as we can to break down the artificial, unbiblical, and death-dealing barriers erected by some in society and in our subculture. It especially resonates with us that Glendale seeks to live out the life-giving good news proclaimed by Jesus with those marginalized by many SDA churches and by too many of the upper administration of the SDA church. Thank you. And so I know Adventism is not monolithic, um, probably not even Adventist today. I do believe in trickle up and I'm trickling up on the organization from my small position as a member. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for that shout out on Glendale. We've heard similar reports uh, from Lauren and others. So it uh, must be a great place. Very good, thank you. And Our since then, just a, just a brief PS, I found out that the conference president of South, uh, Southern California Conference met with the pastor and mentioned to him the letter that he had received. So it didn't make a difference for whatever it's worth. Good. Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, who do we have next? Ray, who's going to speak? Please unmute and go ahead. I usually get a little perturbed by the use of the term soon or it's slow, but there's progress. And then it dawned on to me, maybe we're in just too big of a rush. Time here on this earth is like a split second in what's happening throughout the universe. Look how long it takes for light to travel from the closest star to earth. Or look at all the galaxies that we keep finding out there. Time is sort of an infinite thing. So maybe we should just do our thing and not worry so much about whether it's sooner or later because we're here. It's, it's just a flash. Time, we, we have no real concept. It takes us one year to go around our sun. I mean, we're overly anxious, perhaps. Maybe we should sit back and relax and look at the long view and get over our anxious fear that's all <laughs> i agree with you that we are sometimes maybe uh emphasizing too much that we like speed we like things to progress um but uh, you know uh, i can only speak for myself but i would really like to see uh, some of these changes while I'm still alive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the legalist side of me says, well, we have six more minutes that we got to keep this going. <laughs> we can bring it to an end. Now, I, I do want to ask a question, though, a uh, very quick one. Some years ago, there was a fellow, uh, Jim Collins was his name. He wrote a number of books, and he advocated the notion of, of preserving the core while stimulating pro uh, progress. That's the phrase he used, preserve the core and stimulate progress. Uh, Dr. Brinsma, I'm, I'm wondering if you had to uh, name what it is that you would want to preserve in Adventism, 
while we kind of advocate for change and push for change and so on, what would you want preserved? Uh, I I suppose many of you know the book by uh, by Fritz Guy um, about uh, thinking theologically, and he gives a very good uh, summary, I think, of uh, what he believed is being a genuine Adventist. And he mentions a few things, and that is the core of Christianity, uh, salvation through grace, salvation through Christ. Uh, the uh, he, he mentions the Sabbath and the soon coming of Christ. <laughs> And he mentions the desire to be part of the, uh, the, the, the church as our spiritual home and uh, continuing to be inspired by its, by its past and, uh, and, 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 and have enough empathy for its or enough affinity with its uh, identity to uh, to consider it really a place to be, uh, he mentioned a couple of these things, and these are the most. Uh, also, he mentions uh, the the issue of uh, of a, uh, a a sense of stewardship, and these I I feel very much uh, akin to uh, this way of thinking, uh, and most people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I think, when it comes down to it, they have a kind of canon within the canon. If you ask them, what are the fundamental beliefs? They can mention maybe eight or 10 at most. And these are some of the things that they mention. And uh, so maybe that's a good starting point uh, or point tonight, I don't know. But so there is a core that that I think many Adventists see as the most important things in our doctrinal package. And if we could somehow emphasize that, maybe put that in more up-to-date language, make that more relevant to everyday life, then uh, we would be there to make Adventism more attractive to uh, to lots of people who are now on the fringes.